Hello. Hello. By the way, I just want to make sure, can people hear the fan in my background or am I good? No, no. I think Zoom's no. filters are probably filtering it out. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, most of them have pretty good ones now. Like uh, most of the time, mechanical keyboard, fans, even just breathing and such. Uh, Zoom, WebEx, Slack, like they all have pretty decent baseline these days. And have decent yeah. echo cancellation. <laughs> Yeah, I also my my regular headphones got chewed up by by my cat, so using another set this time. I haven't had mine uh, chewed on by a cat, but uh, in a different meeting, uh, work one uh, months and months back, I was holding my one year old, and the little pieces dangling out there, it has like a little um a little foam ball on it or something. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. he's like trying to like bite it off while I'm holding. Welcome to the new norm, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Kid trying to devour your headset. The usual. Yeah, <laughs> far from the courts. Oh, all I have today is a small, uh, short update on Cloud Custodian, but I'll have to duck out about halfway through. Yeah, we, are, it's a, we have a presentation today, so we're going to do um, I could just take updates and, and then go straight to the presentation. It's a link in the chat. We're all early, we're all super early. <laughs> so we're still going to be the pit. Hi right, everyone, we're just going to wait a couple of minutes uh, waiting on folks to join. We are looking for one or two scraps for today. It'd be great if someone can volunteer. I could uh, scribe for the first half hour if that helps, but after that point, I'll have to hop off. I don't know if that's helping or hurting. <laughs> no, I think that would be helpful. Okay. Hey, Andrew, can you hear us? See you. Can we make sure that we can hear you? Can you hear me? Yep, perfect. Awesome. Um, also, if you just want to check, I'm assuming you chat with Zoom before, right? So we should pick it. More than zero times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. We're just going to wait a couple more minutes for folks to join in. Um, I'm going to paste the meeting notes in again here. Let me um, grab so, three. Gotcha. so you can go in and then put in your name. Um, as well as whether you have any updates. Uh,
I think there's a hot mic. Yeah, I think that's just mic. Um, I uh, I could I could have, uh, this is the Hindi uh, the serial talk going in the background. There we go. Or not? No, no. I I would have to sign in as the other commentator to mute people's mics, but I think uh, I think it's for Andrew, so he, he'll be talking. So <laughs> the problem will go away. With it. I still see folks joining in, so I'm going to wait a couple more seconds. Hey. All right, I'm going to paste the meeting notes in the chat once more. If everyone can go in and put your name in the attendance, um, we still need one person to strike for the later half of the, the, the meeting. Uh, if you can volunteer and scrap, that would be awesome. Awesome. So let's get started. Um, as usual, uh, in the script, hello everyone. So reminder that this meeting is being recorded. It's going to be posted to YouTube after shortly. Um, your participation meeting is should abide by CNCF and uh, tax security COC, and they can be found in repo. Um, I think we have, we're still looking for one more scribe. If someone can volunteer, that would be great. If not, today's, um, today's agenda is going to be a um, presentation. I think we're still having that part mic so far. Can we well, that up? Um, Mark and uh, Alok, could you double check if your mics are muted, please? I think you're the only two unmuted mics, and I think we have a hot mic going on. Yeah, I think it's Alok's mic. Alok? Alok Rush? Are you there? There yes. we go. Can you mute when that's speaking? That'd be great. Gotcha. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Beautiful. <laughs> All right. It happens. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So it looks like we only have one main uh, update today. So so what we're going to do is, um, so before I go ahead, do we have any new members today? I want to do an introduction. Um, I could introduce myself. Uh, I'm, I'm new. <laughs> um, I just wanted to join and yeah, see what's what's going on. Um, I'm, I'm Mark, I'm, I'm from Switzerland. I work for TNM. Um, it's a software company yeah, in, in Zurich. And I'm uh, a software engineer, but mainly, mainly involved in cloud projects. Yeah, and I'm, I'm interested in cloud native technology and I thought I would like to yeah, join uh, and yeah, contribute to, to one of the techs. And I think security is quite interesting. And um, I already went through all the the, the topics and open issues on GitHub. So I, I have a few questions. Maybe we have time in the end. And um, yeah, I'm I'm happy to be here. And yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. It. Yeah, that, that's that's great. And Mark, if, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us or any of the other um, community members or the co chairs of DLs, and then we can we can help you along. Um, or just post in the tax security channel. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Welcome, Mark. I I was thinking maybe I could introduce myself too. I've I've been to a few of these meetings, but I I guess I, I missed the opportunity to uh, to introduce myself and say hello on previous ones. Um, so my name's Axel Simon. I I work at Red Hat in the office of the CTO on a security team. Um, I work, for instance, with Luke Hines, who is one of the people who started the uh, Six Door project, and who's been very active on Keylime. So I've I've worked a little bit on Six Door, a bit on Keylime, uh, and in the past I've also worked on the NRX project, uh, which does confidential computing using uh, trusted execution environments, which is also a very cool project. So um, yeah, interested in all in all things security, um, and interested currently mostly in uh, in secure in you know inverted commas uh, software supply chains or as secure as we can make them at least. So um, yeah, I'm happy to be here and interested in, in the conversations in general. And I've, so far I've seen a few cool demos, so that's also really nice. So thanks. Awesome. 
Thanks, Axel. Yeah, I've, I've seen you around <laughs> for the last few meetings. Uh, that's great. Cool. Um, and also, quick a reminder for those that uh, have joined the, the, the past few meetings, you know, for like a month or two, um, do feel free to add yourself as a PR to the members list on the main page. Um, there is a members list on the main page, it's hidden behind the expandable section. But yeah, welcome, Mark and Axel. All right, so moving forward, uh, review of other time zone security type meetings. I don't think we had anything on APEC the last time. Um, so we are going to skip that. Um, TOC meeting updates. Um, we did an update, uh, the regular tech security update on Tuesday. Uh, it, was, it went well. There was good feedback on the PR that we have with the security resources, like the security.md page and things like that. Um, they are working with us to upstream that to the contributing, the SIG contributing and um, uh, contributing resources that we have on CNCF. Thank you, Malak, for helping me paste that. Um, and general check-ins today quickly. I think we only have one from Cloud Custodian. Matthew, do you wanna say a few words? Sure, I, Rob uh, Ficalia and uh, myself the other day uh, had another meetup with the Cloud Custodian team, just going through the joint review, populating it, uh, assigning ownership of sections. And am I coming through, Brennan? Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, just assigning ownership to some remaining sections. I already did a call for reviewers to see if anyone wanted to populate the uh, the threat model section. There's already the self-assessment variant of that, and we're just copy-pasting it in and getting whatever material we can fill in there. And last but not least, my understanding is next week's iteration will be our last one, if I have that correct, for uh, Cloud Custodian, sometimes abbreviated C7N. And I believe we'll have the remaining pieces in there. I do not believe we'll be doing a hands-on assessment like benchtop testing and all that, but uh, that should pretty much conclude the last of what we have to do with it for this foreseeable future. Uh, I believe I see Rob on the call if uh, he wants to add anything to that or if I got anything off there, uh, if I uh, misspoken anything there, but that's pretty much my update on Cloud Custodian. Oh, that uh, I think accurately captures it. We're hoping to wrap it up this week and uh, hand it, uh, present back to the uh, custodian team for their review. And then, Brandon, we should schedule our presentation to this group uh, maybe two, three weeks out. Awesome. Sounds great. This was a very efficient assessment. <laughs> and well, then, uh, my, uh, just a policy. Uh, work group met this morning. We do every other week at uh, 8 a.m. Pacific. So we are working on a white paper drill down for Kubernetes policy topics specifically. And we have a, a KubeCon uh, uh, panel that's been accepted. So we'll be presenting. Awesome. Uh, Matthew, do you have your own thing? Uh, the only thing I was going to add on top is uh, after uh, Cloud Custodian, I'll just run it by you and the team before I start uh, pinging people on the uh, Argo channel to start getting that underway. Yep, I'll go assessment on the next. Awesome. Um, Andreas said that he has his body connection, but may be able to give an update on security, cognitive security con. He said, Dan. Yeah, right. Dan, go ahead. You're on mute. I expect this to work in. It's not working. Okay. So, um, We've, you know, we've obviously looking at the, you know, CFPs to kind of determine, obviously the, you know, the, the choices for that. We we went through that with a fine tooth comb. Uh, it's it's been there's been amazing submissions. I mean, just it's my mind's blown from the amount of great submissions we've had. Um, we're, we've talked this morning in terms of logistics around the CTF, which was really cool, which is obviously one of our you know favorite parts of the uh, uh, the event, and it's also the logistics talking about you know what we'll have either in person or virtual. Um, but it's going very well. If there's anybody has any questions about the event, feel free to ask. Pardon, I was just taking the notes. Which event was this again, Dan? It's the, the co-located Cloud Native Security Con. 
Thank you. Sorry, Connie. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> yeah, that disclaimer there. Getting that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like I said, I mean, going back to submissions, it's phenomenal. Like the amount of stuff. So it's really exciting what we'll be presenting. So awesome. All right, thanks for the update, Ben. So I think that that comes to the end of our check-ins and updates. Um, any last, last takes before we get into the presentation? All right, cool. So today we have um, Andrew, Andrew Clay Schaefer here that is going to talk to us about um, security differently or selfish security. I've Take a sneak peek of the slides and it looks really, really interesting. So I'm not going to delete this any further. And sure, take the floor. I, I changed all the slides, but they're, oh, they're, I, I mean, there, there's a lot of the same <laughs> ones too. But right. I, 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 my ADHD will let me stop tweaking stuff. So, so should we just fire it up? Yeah, go for it. Up. Oh, all right. Let's see if this little magic works computers. So I think we're good. Everyone can see a red screen. Yep. Audio video coming through five by five. All right, let's go. First, you know, thanks for having me. I'll introduce myself a little bit and then we'll get to it. Motivation for kind of giving this talk, and, and Andreas is the one that put me in in um, in touch with with this group and said like, come talk a little bit about this, this stuff. But my background and kind of the things I did before got me in a position to have some of the conversations I have now. My focus has really been on open source infrastructure automation for uh, about sixteen years. So my first commits in Puppet were two thousand four. I worked on Puppet as a co-founder until 2009. Then I was a, a VP of engineering at an OpenStack startup that was sold to EMC. Then I spent five years at Pivotal and got into Cloud Foundry and Spring and Kafka and a bunch of this other craziness. And then got more and more into Kubernetes, obviously, because that's the thing. And then transitioned uh, to Red Hat about two years ago, not quite two years ago. In parallel to that, I've been organizing uh, events and like part of these communities um, as a participant and as a community builder, uh, organized DevOps days, wrote some books for O'Reilly on web operations, uh, wrote a forward in the SRE book that Google just published and you know just have a bunch of experiences, scar tissue, opinions, and I'm going to share some of that um, lesson today. So the the next slide is is really just to show you my peak uh, pandemic beard and hair because that's very important. And then this one is critically important because it's my Twitter handle and my and my name. So if you want to reach out on LinkedIn or Twitter, hit me up and we can talk about this stuff more. Uh, this is various configurations of hair and beard from the last few years, just so you know, you have that when we run into each other. So I, I would not consider myself, whoops, I skipped this slide, I think. There we go. Uh, I, don't, I don't really consider myself a security expert. What would I have become fascinated with um, as, as security as a constraint, which I'll, I'll talk through the rest of this is that you, you run into security as a ball neck, as you make all these investments in, in automation, whether you're talking about the older style of automation with things like Puppet or the new container platforms, at some point the bottleneck is the, all these practices around security. So what I consider myself is a pattern matcher and puzzle solver. I really like solving puzzles. And, and this constraint, this bottleneck, over and over and over, you run into this. And especially in, in regulated environments where if you if you have the old style for everything, then a deployment might take months. So having this process of inspection, this the security um, cost, if you will, be, be two weeks or one week or whatever is, is not noticeable when you're baked into that bigger process. But as you get to where you can make decisions on the order of seconds, like we can now with some of the cloud services, then having that kind of overhead for every deployment is just is just a crazy cost, right? So if you think about if you if you think about the movements of the last ten years, you have deployments in in time with continuous and 
uh, delivery, and then deployments in space with microservices. If you have a very heavy weight in inspection driven security posture to, to all of those deployments, then that's going to be a, a bad time and you're not going to get good results either. You like literally can't keep up with this. So this is the, this is the short version burning your head that security is not really a thing. It's not yes or no. It's, it's a qualitative thing, right? And, and there's, there's no one, at least, at least people I consider um, good at this, that believes that you can quote unquote be secure, right? It's a, it's a question of the adversaries. It's a question of the risk and, and, the, and the profile. And I'm going to make a bunch of analogies back to reliability. Um, like, like if you're talking about reliability and making investments in reliability, every nine of reliability costs you 10 times more than the last one. So, so at what point does it make sense to keep investing, investing in security proportional to the risk of the, of the assets you're protecting? Then the second point is that security is not a, it's not a quality of the technology by itself. It's a quality of the humans and the technology as a single system. And so there's a bunch of other interesting research, which we don't have time to dive into today around socio-technical systems, but recognizing humans as agents first class in that system is important, uh, that there's, all those agents have collective or, or, or they have selfish interests. And, and the game we're trying to play is making them uh, support security in favor of those collective interests, that broken things will, get fixed, but things that are just bad can often live forever in organizations and that change can be hard. So keep going. So this is Legacy Andrew, 2010. I wrote a blog post because um, there's a bunch of people talking about DevOps and I was one of them. And, and this is sort of the DevOps version of 2010 from Andrew. So developers operations can should work together. System administrations of all them look more like software development evolving together as a global community sharing um, solutions. I think the third point is actually the most interesting and exciting to me. I think that we have the same opportunity um, with, with security and especially you know, the, the types of, of communities and, and conversations we're having right now. But the second one is interesting and you see like basically system administration in the old, old world was like lots of toil, lots of tasks, lots of work was done. And then coming into 2010, you could provision systems, you could configure systems, you could monitor systems, all APIs, running to APIs looks suspiciously like software development, but you have this resistance in system administration communities to doing work that way. Um, and, and, and even things as simple as that, you know, putting, putting the shell scripts in Git would meet resistance in some of these organizations. And I think that there's a similar dynamic in some of the security conversations where security professionals in certain organizations have been doing work a certain way for a long time. And the, the security that we're seeing evolve, you know, a lot of the people on this call, I believe are involved with is, is going to make, is going to change that dynamic, but you kind of have to get through that resistance. And, and part of my motivation for this kind of conversation is to help rate that, right. And get through uh, where, where you can make, those people comfortable or get them kind of on the other side of, of that um, chasm. So this is me again, like in the before times when you could leave the house giving, giving uh, a talk at a conference. And, and this is a definition I use uh, many times for what DevOps means to me, right? So this is sort of like a newer version. It's optimizing the human experience and performance operating software with software and with humans. And just to be like fully buzzword compliant, this is sort of what I try to help people do, right? So continuously DevOps, microserverless, we can, we can like put secure in there somewhere too, why not? All right, so this, this is pretty famous. Uh, most people have seen this and I, I used to get really frustrated trying to help organizations, you know, adopt or, or implement certain things. And what, what would end up happening and what was frustrating was they would, they would change their titles. You know, now we're DevOps or, or the new one is, you know, now we're SRE. But they would change literally nothing else, right? And, and so what I what I got frustrated with until I, I started reading some of this research, which is interesting sociology research, is that what what's happening is in the early adopters and, and in the innovators as well, which you know I think there's innovators and early adopters in these conversations right now. The motivation is to change something so they can get an advantage, and then what what happens is certain point in the in the cycle into the 
majority is that you're no longer seeking an advantage. You're actually seeking legitimacy, right? So you have these practices, they're advantage seeking and, and they get an advantage, right? So you see things like the, the state of DevOps report and it says, so all these metrics. And so then people are like, oh, that's legitimized. And so then they start changing the name. You see this over and over with a lot of these movements, right? So it's like agile practices didn't really cross the chasm. Like the future is here for all this work, for all the security stuff, but it hasn't really come into the future in, in an evenly distributed way. So what can we do to accelerate this? So I'm not gonna talk about all this stuff. Hopefully um, this stuff you all talk about all the time um, or, or, or have some knowledge of. Um, so it's like a meta talk around this and I'm, I'm not, not gonna talk about it either. I think there's starting to be some, some clarity on this vision of how this stuff all fits together where you have you know, some strong identity, you have some promises you can keep about the verifiability of the deployable artifacts and all, all those pieces are kind of coming together in a nice way. And I, I'm, I'm as excited to kind of consume that and help other people implement that as anyone, but I, I don't necessarily need to talk to you. So from the very beginning, like I, I don't think that the principles of a lot of this stuff has changed, right? So you know, back in the in the puppet days, like puppet acted like a um, certificate authority, and one of the one of the most difficult things, and you know, we didn't have uh, Spiffy at the time, is, is like how do you manage identity for the agents? How do you manage the certificates? How do you sign them? Like how how do you set up those workflows in a way that you could keep strong promises? And it, and in some cases, um, and, and you know, not not to blame any guilty parties, but lots of people um, just just made it all self signing. Right, because that was like the easy that was the the, the easy path to to get the the configuration. So so kind of like the principles that I see emerging with with that set of um, projects and tools is being able to keep uh, some kind of verifiable who, what, and when for everything that's happening in, in these deployments, everything that's happening in these infrastructures, and, and there's stuff that you know the company I work for. Is doing that is related to this. There's there's conversations I'm having with people across the industry that I think are interested. In. You know, I talk to Andreas quite frequently. Um, he he works for you know in theory the our biggest competitor, so that's fine. So this is not really that different in the sense that people always try to solve auth authorization and authentication problems. We just have better tools. We just have a, a, a kind of like more advanced way to do it. And this this to me like when people start talking about zero trust. I, I think when you actually start reading, there's like a lot of trust everywhere. Like there, there's, the word trust is used quite explicitly um, all over the place. But, but what you're getting to is this verified version of things where, you know, you can keep strong, you know, even cryptographic promises about what is happening, where the old style of doing this was, was about toil. It was like manual work to inspect the, the process, right, and, and, and sign the signature. So we're moving to this world of continuously verified. So where were we? Word salad from Andrew. So software is eating the world. Everyone's sort of seen that. Software is actually eating software, right? So that's like a big part of all this stuff for deployment, for monitoring, for every, every one of these little pieces is becoming more about software, more about service, less about humans doing repetitive tasks. And, and then what we're, we're part of and what we're having conversations today is software is eating software security as well. So what does that mean? Well, we have this world that we've built collectively built together, of supercomputers everywhere, connecting all human knowledge to high-speed networks, um, but also to adversaries. And every aspect of human performance and experience can be, that can be optimized. This, this is sort of my definition of, of DevOps is about how things are optimized. Um, it will be optimized and that includes owning you. And, and this is an arms race, right? So, you know, kind of like an update to the, the thing, previous thing is like all these roles can work together. What looks like security, like there's the, the dev sack part of it is you, you need to develop these things, um, but you also need to connect them to, to the operations and the rest of these other selfish interests. And there's a bunch of lessons that you don't have to learn the hard way because we can participate in these global communities and reuse the, the, the things that other people like. So this is a pretty famous quote in, in kind of like DevOps conversations. Um, from 2006. So Werner Vogels, I'll, I'll just read the first part. So traditional models, you take your software to the wall that separates development operations, throw it over and then forget about it. Not at Amazon, you build it, you run it, right? Like people say this all the time. It's like, okay. And, and I think people get confused about what Werner means and what the situation was like at Amazon in 2006. Also, who, who, who secures that? 
um, I, I don't know. And, and then our, another lesson you're learning today is that um, DevOps is all about communicating ideas with, with memes, I would say. So when Ben Berner Bogle says, you, you build it, you run it, he means you run the top layer of that three layer cake. He, he doesn't mean, like at the time when he says that in 2006, EC2 is launched. And there's a bunch of infrastructure as a service that's already been built up. And, and every single one of these companies has this, which as a point I'll make in a minute, um, the, the, those, those developers aren't provisioning and operating their own databases. They're not provisioning you know, operating systems, all this kind of underlying infrastructure. They're, they're really just worried about that top layer. And now the rest of that is sort of done for them, right? So this is a, a kind of a classic DevOps framing of what came to be known as the wall of confusion, which, which came from talks I gave a long time ago. So traditional IT, and there's usually like a build up and it's like you communicate through ticket systems, you don't even see each other as human and it makes people mischievous, right? So that's like a traditional DevOps conversation. Um, but I, I, I kind of revisited this through this lens of this colleague I have, um, Jay, I'm gonna introduce some of his ideas in a minute, that the part of what's happening here is that these are two different games so you, so people are playing different games trying to win um the game they're playing and maybe don't have an understanding or connection to the other one so this is what jabe and his research and and i try to give um jabe credit because also um if people do academics then they like it when their work is, is referenced so um he he's a phd at carnegie mellon focus on how organizations change their behavior take advantage of technology and what he talks about is this three economies i'm going to use the third one in a minute, but the two are what, what he calls differentiation economy and the scale economy. And, and to sort of oversimplify it, and we'll just go super fast to get to, to more ideas in a minute, it is like one side's trying to create more, more value and one side's trying to drive down costs. So you could say, you know, one side's trying to destabilize this and our try, sorry, side is trying to stabilize it. Um, and you see this play out in organizations as a tension between you know, business units and IT operations all the time. And those, those two games kind of like force us to be against each other if we don't, if we don't put something in the middle to, to, to smooth that out. And then we can add another one, right? So, so we have like the, this like DevSecOps conversation and I don't know where, where you all work, um, but, but the, the developers and the security people and operating people, operations aren't always on the same page. Um, if you get really deep into this, like you start to realize sometimes the risk and compliance people aren't on the same page as the security people either, but we'll, we'll, um, we'll pretend it's, it's this simple for a minute. So there's, there's these walls of confusion between these different roles because they have a, a selfish understanding um, of what they're trying to optimize for. So is there a way to kind of move that wall um, and, and, and help those things um, understand each other, right? So the, the, the walls there because we don't understand and we don't understand we're connected to each other, right? So for a variety of reasons, some of it to do with, with the, this, the size of some of these organizations, uh, the silos sort of evolve in a way where they, they're optimizing for the game they're playing. They don't really realize, or, or some of the worst cases care what anyone else is doing because they're, they're doing their quote unquote job, right? So can we win all these games together? Um, I'm going to argue we can, and that there's a new way to play. And, and the new way to play is very much related to these communities um, that we're talking about with, with the CNCF. So the new game, and this is, this is also from Jabe's um, research, is what he calls the scope economy. And so the scope economy emerges as a game where you can balance the, the needs of the differentiation in the scale economy to enable innovation and efficiency, and dun, 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 um, I'm gonna argue, you can also use this to enable security. So hopefully we can make this more concrete but this is, this is to me like this money shot that I've sort of reimagined all of the DevOps conversations from the last decade through this lens, that this, this scope economy results from an ongoing negotiation between all of these selfish interests in favor of the collective interests, right? And so if you go back in time to all the, all the conversations, um, all the projects around automation, you know, go back to Puppet Chef, Ansible, what have you, before you even get to containers, but it's still the same thing, then, then it was always trying to enable innovation and keep promises to operations. Um, and to the extent that you had these conversations, that you drove that kind of meaningful um, 
collective interest into the manifestation of the of the platform, you got good results. And you, you see this carry on into the container Kubernetes conversations, where if you have a, a quote unquote platform team that has a you build it and they will come mentality, but doesn't include the selfish interests of the developers line of business that they're trying to build that platform for, then you don't always get the, the adoption that you imagined you would, right? And so, so like the game that I try to help people play and understand here is the more you can bring those agents to the table to have that ongoing negotiation about what our actual needs are, what does success look like for us, then the better results you're gonna get with your initiatives. So trying to make it more concrete, there's things that begin as an innovation that more might be more valuable in that shared platform. Like so, so examples, if you have optimized for innovation and you're letting every development team do whatever they want, then you're gonna get a, a bunch of sprawling ways to implement pipelines, a bunch of different models for how they're gonna you know, do some, certain things with data, what have you. And there's probably some collective um, interest that could be better served if those were, were consolidated in a meaningful way that you're getting use across the organization. Um, same, same argument I'm gonna make um, for security that there's, there's, if you're leaving the developers to be experts in security across all those different things where developers are constantly making choice between doing things right and doing things right now with the incentives they have, you're not gonna have very secure um, software. And then conversely, there's the opposite thing. And this is where they're talking about operations and security, you have this other side where there's probably resources that are overly restricted um, in, the, in the current practices that would be more valuable if they were in, in kind of like this pre-audited configuration part of the shared platform where developers could have self-service access to do the work they wanted, right? So I'm gonna argue that every cloud native company built platforms that essentially acted as a scope economy construct for that, for that company to connect the innovation of the developers, that developer productivity with the operational efficiency. And I think this is especially critical as you get to a certain scale. You just, you simply can't um, exceed a certain scale unless you start building these things. And, and it's a Darwinian force that makes you, you have to do it or you literally can't pass that, that point. So this is uh, straight from the SRE book, SRE build framework modules to implement canonical solutions for the concerned production area. As a result, development teams can focus on the business logic because the framework already takes care of correct infrastructure use. This is Google explaining how they built their shared platform, the scope economy construct. I'm gonna argue, and, and I'm sure some of you, or I would hope some of you have read the Borg paper. Um, the Borg is really this scope economy construct that, that manifests itself at Google. Kubernetes as sort of the, the daughter of Borg, the spiritual evolution of Borg is a scope economy construct, yay. Um, and then this is this like, kind of like the thing I think about is interesting is that Kubernetes is this open source global commons to build these local shared platform commons. And if you're familiar with SLO, I told you I was gonna borrow from um, reliability and drag it back. It, like the SLO process and setting up an SLO is this commoning exercise, this, this negotiation between the software engineers and SRE um, about about what the service level should be, right? Are we are we willing to invest ten times more to get to the next nine for the service level of the service or not, based on you know the value that we're creating? So what's the what's the equivalent negotiation for securability? And and what are the principles of securability? So so in thinking about this and like how I want to form this, and I wouldn't say this is like the, the a, a super well formed thought, but this was uh, something that had a huge impact on me 10 years ago, um, over 10 years ago, wa watching Joe Armstrong give this talk, The Six Laws of Reliability. And, and the, I, I, I kind of like borrowed this in a lot of work I did and, and a lot of talks I gave, but now, now you have like al almost like full genres, subgenres uh, uh, of DevOps that are like just focused on, so like observability is basically failure detection and fault determination. Most of what people, are doing with their kind of like microservices, platformy, Kubernetes things is really about building in isolation, concurrency, and, and live um, code upgrade. Stable storage, you know, we're still working through that, but that that's critical for um, the model that the, the the principles that Joe sets up here because you need to be able to trust that you, when you write something, you can get it back to be able to you know build systems that, that never stop, and, and that that's not as trivial as it sounds, especially as you get to certain levels of scale and, and, and um, reliability. 
so so I don't know where this is going, but and maybe we can I'll, I'll kind of like work on this and, and have conversation about it. But uh, this is me being silly on, on Twitter. Uh, I believe this very strongly. I said this in 2014. I think it's still true, kind of like watching this evolve that any sufficiently complicated microservice deployment contains an ad hoc inform informally specified bug rid ridden implementation of half of Erlang. If you really go look at how Erlang was implemented and Beam as a runtime works, um, it, th there's a lot of these principles of reliability like baked into the runtime. So this is this is permission to find good ideas where they are and and steal them, right? So I I, I love this um, and that's a great thing. So this is stealing from another thing. This is the from the the reliability or the um, SRE book that Google published. These these chapters, no matter what your role is in a software organization, the the, the principles chapters of the uh, first SRE book are solid gold, and it's these three. Um, titles. And if you haven't read that, I recommend you do it. You can read it for free. It'll take you probably half an hour. Um, but especially from a security perspective, what is the what is the risk that you're willing to, to do? How are you making it so this is not a manual process? And then what is the appropriate level, right? So this is borrowing that quote and kind of reframing it. Security engineers build framework models to implement canonical solutions for the concern production area. As a result, development teams can focus on the business logic because the framework already takes care of of security considerations, right? So we're trying to build these platforms where the experts in security can do the work that makes it so the rest of the um, development teams don't need to be focused on that. They don't need to be experts on that because it's already taken care of that for them, just like the reliability would be. So, so how does that platform get implemented? So this is this is like a quick um, one-on-one version of, of Wardley. Simon Wardley does this thing called Wardley mapping, and it's like not the point I want to make today, but th this is kind of an interesting thing. And the, and the one thing I want to focus on here is he separates the why of purpose from the why of movement, right? So, so like the analogy he uses when he sets up um, this in, in his book is the why of purpose is to win the game, right? And so he's using this analogy of chess. And, and the why of purpose is clear, like you want to win the game. The why of movement is less clear. And, and and in particular, when you're looking at a chessboard, you're evaluating a position, what, what level of understanding you have about a bunch of different principles will determine what piece you decide to move, right? Because you can only move one. And, and so that's like a, a kind of like a deeper why or a different why than the why purpose. The why purpose is very simple, very clear. And, and I think this is where a lot of organizations sort of stops. Like they put their values on the wall. Here's why we're here. But then they, they don't have good whys of, of movement and they don't connect the whys of movement. So, this is just my like idealized org chart, right? So there's all these people and they all have whys and there's a bigger why. And each one of those whys could be very different for each person, right? Like I have a family, I have kids, I have all these other things that I come to work and I, I, I you know, take some pride in my craft and I take some pride in the work, but I also have all these other whys that kind of drive. And then to the extent that organizations can connect each of those individual agents and the why that they have to those larger whys, the better results they're going to have, and then someone has to do actual work, right? So this is this is the what, like what do we do, and that's where the why of, of movement comes out. So this is like again an oversimplified platitudinal thing is that you have all these communities of practice in an organization. So developers have um, you know some notion of what it means to be an excellent developer. That is their why of movement, right? Like they they understand if they see this chessboard, we're going to move this piece this way. Operation similar, business similar, security similar. Like they, they all have different ways of movement. So the game that we're trying to play in our organizations to help accelerate the, the adoption and the um, impact of, of this work is creating these united communities of interests that cross all these boundaries with the united why of purpose. So everyone's gonna have a different way of movement, but you have to connect those to that, that larger thing. So in, in future, and this is something that I'm actively trying to help um, some of my customers do, it, it's like get the, the, the security conversations much earlier in the process, get the security posture, the risk profile as part of that platform building, commenting the interest, bring the, bring the selfish interest of security into the conversation. Sometimes people um, like to say shift left. Um, I think that that anchors everything on languages that read left to right. So I like to say shift forward. We wanna bring, bring these conversations earlier and earlier, the selfish interest earlier and earlier into what gets built. So we don't build things that aren't fit for purpose, right? You can't add 
security after the fact onto all these things that were done without security in mind. So the holy grail we want to get to is this, this framing where you have developers who can be creating um, innovation for the organization. You have the, these platforms that keep promises to those developers enabling them with that self-service access. And then, and then you have these securable kind of compute networking and storage primitives underneath that, that do all the things they need to do. So sometimes people say stuff like this to me and I'm just like, cool story. Because this is never really done. Like DevOps never done, security's never done. It's an ongoing process to improve the quality that the socio-technical system that you're actively building can, can do, right? So you're continuously doing it. So as you think about the adoption and, and kind of the arc of the narrative, you know, seeing some of the exciting things that you all are working on, understand that resistance to change is the only thing more inevitable than change, right? And so, so like you, you meet organizations and they're like, we would really like to automate stuff. And it's like, well, how long do you think that will take? Three years. And you're like, okay, I'll try to help you. But uh, is there some way we could do that a little faster? Because I'm impatient. So this is something you run into over and over. You, you have these organizations and, and they just do things a certain way and, and they don't want to change because that, like I do security. I've done security for decades. Like why, why would I do it different? Like we're obviously secure. And, and I think there's a funny conversation. This is a side. Um, I had lots of conversations with people that worked in like, you know, big web, you know, cloud native companies. I have lots of conversations with, with banks and, and other, other kind of like secretive three layer agencies or whatever. And it, there's this there's this kind of weird dynamic where no one who's worked in both thinks that the, the the banks are better at security than the cloud natives but sometimes the banks think they are which is like i don't know fascinating but let, let's do better so this is my advice to you when you think about this technology adoption life cycle where you work where you want to work um legitimacy is whatever like we make ourselves legitimate by being legit um, so let's try to win, win games, seek advantages. So kind of coming to the end of this, the, this problem that we're trying to solve with security, with reliability, with whatever other abilities we want to add is not a purely technical problem. It's also not a purely social problem, right? Like there's social engineering involved, but the technical excellence has to be as big a part of the equation. And I think sometimes people swing the pendulum too far to you know, the soft side. And so it's like, you want to find that balance in the middle. And, and it's a socio-technical problem and you have to solve both of them together. That's what will give you um, the, the results you want. And this is a very famous quote from a very famous person. I don't have time to learn new things because I'm too busy getting things done. And hopefully you don't work with this person because this is the least productive person in the world. So that's the end. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, I'm just being silly here, but I'm not here to, have, to answer questions. I'm here to have conversations. So that's... Uh, quick run through Andrew's random thoughts about building secure platforms. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Um, let's open up for questions or conversations. <laughs> Don't all talk at once. <laughs> the thing is there's so much, there's so much food for thought. And I think, I mean, on a personal level, I relate to a lot of what you're saying. I find it very interesting, but it feels like it's a conversation I'd want to have over coffee or you know a few beers and two hours versus. I, I, I got know, coffee right minutes. right here. I mean, I I think I'm also known for like trying to cram like way too much content in 30 minute talks. I, I try not to do that as bad as I have before, but there's a lot to there's a lot to cover and there's like lots of nuance to like this is sort of like the high level platitudinal version of like. You need to have these conversations. You need to get these like selfish interests involved in doing this. It's simple, but it's actually not easy, right? And then like once you get into organizations, the practical aspect of this and what I, I tell people all the time is if you show me your org chart and your funding model, I'll predict all the changes that will be hard for you. Yeah, and that's, so it's I, not I just think about that's absolutely- It's about incentives. And I think that's absolutely true as well. Like some of the conversations I've had with uh, leadership at various companies, it, the conversation ends up going like, okay, so here's what we're doing with zero trust. Here's what we're doing with cloud native. And they're like people, the leadership and 
uh, both on the social and technical side will agree, yeah, this is a really great idea. It's what we want to do. It's like, well, why haven't you, uh, why haven't you done it yet? And it comes down to, well, we don't have the budget. We don't have the skills. We don't have the, uh, we, we don't have the strategy that's, that's there that, uh, that allows us to, to migrate. And they, they know that they're in a, in a position where the world continues to change and the gap continues to increase uh, with the assumptions that they made to previously secure their system uh, becomes further and further eroded. Uh, but that, uh, that gap in, in skill and uh, budget is, is enormous. I think there's a couple dynamics that you bring up that are worth pointing out. So there's there's this kind of per perception of a, a talent shortage or skills gap, and, and there's certainly aspects of that in organizations, but in most cases, it's self-inflicted. And, and it's inflicted by this kind of mindset where they're framing, they're framing IT as a cost center, which is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you want to get to the other side of this, and if you look at what the true cloud natives are, are filing with the SEC, um, in, at least in the US, then, then it's like they, they've reframed IT as a competitive advantage. And they're making investments in that advantage. And so there's kind of like this tension to get through. The, the thing that I think is actually harder to overcome in, in, in my um, experience is this thing where you go into an organization and, and you're like, okay, what are we trying to do here? And, and they kind of like map out what they're doing and they have a silo that's a SRE team that's different than, a, than, the, um, than the DevOps team that's different than the DevSecOps team. And they have a different initiative for continuous delivery than they have for microservices. And it's like all these little, you can just see this kind of like game of thrones that's been played with, with building silos around some of these budgets and, and head counts. And, and that's, that's in my opinion, almost harder to work through than people who like, oh, we don't have the talent. Like you can, you can get talent. Like, okay, like what is the minimum viable investment you can make in making progress from a greenfield um, perspective? I, I actually think that's easier to make progress than when they already have this entrenched thing and they think they implemented, you know, some buzzword, but, but they have like all these silos about it. Dude, amazing conversation starter. I, I really appreciate it. And I think this is going to branch off and forth into many, many different permutations. Fast forward, like we align our selfish interests to the collective of the greater community. What cautionary advice do you have to avoid the tragedy of the commons? Um, I mean, th th this is like a huge rabbit hole. So there's Starting, starting with the tragedy of the commons, if you really look at the sociology and, and who made that argument and why it was made, it's sort of, ra it's sort of rooted in, in racism, which I, I don't necessarily want to have that conversation right now. Um, there, there's a person named Ostrom who, who gave a, um, she got a Nobel Prize for, for like this research on, on building commons and, and like managing resources as a commons. And that, that, research, that, that research is fascinating and I think more interesting and relevant than, than the framing around the, the, or the argument that's trying to be made with the tragedy of the commons. Because um, it, it's basically an argument for centralized control uh, of resources, right? That, that's what the tragedy of the commons is, is trying to. Um, and, and, you know, you look at the dynamics of open source and like some of these other things, I think some of that already stands as a bit of a counterexample. Not, not that every open source product I've been involved with turned out exactly how I thought it should but um, at the end of the day like there is immense value that's being unlocked by these communities that we're part of right so that's sort of a meandering way to say that I, I actually don't think the tragedy of the commons in particular is something that needs to be avoided but at the end of the day what, what can we do to maximize our, our collective outcomes right and so, so there, there's like a few levels of collective here right so we so we all have our organizational collectives and then, and then there's this greater collective, and I don't want to get too philosophical, um, or maybe I do want to get too philosophical, but like there's some really crazy stuff facing planet Earth right now, right? When you think about like the larger global geopolitical stuff, you know, pandemics, climate change, all these other things. So if we're not going to start to act in our collective interests, you know, aligned with our selfish interests, then then I'm not, you know, too too too. Uh, keen on what we're going to be faced with over the next decade or two. 
So only tragic if you're at one point an innovator seeking advantage, but you did it once, didn't do it again. You hope to like rig the game, but you don't have the other two economies equalize or like keep balances in check. So yeah, like over long. I mean, I think I think the game wouldn't be tragic. Like it's about it's about the situational awareness, right? So like there's a deeper um, treatment of that idea in other other kind of conversations I have right now, where if you if you have um, those out of balance with each other in an organization, you can kind of predict the pathology of the behavior, right? So if you get too out of balance on the innovation economy, then you're creating um, you know lots of vulnerabilities and lots of downstream operational burden for the organization. And if you get too out of balance on the other side, then you're basically stopping the the work that could be done. So it's 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 more about understanding like what's the chessboard you're playing with right now like not, not an imaginary like chessboard not 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 like a figment of of whatever philosophical chessboard but like what is the organizational reality of of this you know problem i'm trying to solve and like what what are the interventions that we could do also this is another thing i think leadership in most organizations really struggle with is reality is not very deterministic like like there's probabilities and and a lot of leaders for whatever reason prefer predictability and, and and planning things in this kind of like concrete way that doesn't match reality right so so as soon as you make those plans there's a few versions of this quote but like plans never survive first contact with reality right so so what i try to help under, under people understand is creating optionality flexibility you know whatever you want to call it resilience so that you can respond to the, the organizational mission so that you can, whether that's um, a financial mission or some of these other, like some of the people I work with don't necessarily have a um, financial problem they're trying to solve, but, but what, is the, what is the problem that you're trying to solve and what's the best way to make incremental progress towards that? And from a, a software perspective, I feel like lots of people get wrapped around the axle around innovation where for the most part, there's actually very little information or innovation, and there's very little need for innovation. What most organizations actually need and what they really want is the obvious solution to their obvious problems, which comes down to, you have all this data, how can you organize it in a way that the right people have access to it, that they can make the right decision to optimize their performance and experience. And, and for the most part, I think a lot of those things are solved problems. We just put organizational roadblocks in our way of solving them, but it's obvious solutions to obvious problems. It's just getting all the selfish interests aligned to solve it. Totally, and bringing it back to Mark Underwood's comment and chat. Mark, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. We, we have not a whole lot of time left, but while a lot of problems and risks are domain specific, uh, as a model, this still might be like beneficial to identify, well, the game theory as a whole. What do you think? So, so I mean, again, this like almost deserves another hour to have a conversation, right? So, so like, obviously there's domain specific things. There's corner cases. Um, I made this comment about the, the risk and compliance people and the security people. What, what we, what I think we're moving into being able to do and keep strong promises about is not necessarily that things are secure, but that things are verified to be in compliance with our, with our security, with our risk posture. And that, that's a weaker promise, but I think that's one that we can, we have a hope of keeping with the, with the current kind of tool sets that are emerging. So, so you still need, you still need those domain experts, right? And, and I would, I would take it um, and, and draw it back to the reliability analogy I was making all along is, there's no organization on this planet, you know, Google being probably the exemplar that believes that they could just set up their infrastructure and their applications and turn their backs on them and they'll all be fine, right? Like Google employs a lot of very, very smart people and powers a lot of very smart people to be SREs precisely because they don't believe that. With all their investments in AI, with all their investments in automation of their infrastructure, it's still that social technical system of those reliability um, engineers. And I think that there's an analogy here for, for security where you need that domain expertise to be brought to, to bear on those cases where it's, it's needed. 
Yeah, knowledge and experience is, is more, more and more relevant than ever before. That, that's the shortage is experience, not talent. I think we have, we have time for one more question. There, there are some uh, comments in the chat as well. Um, Andrew, I think someone mentioned a Usenix talk. The um, Elevate Security at Enigma 2018 talk. I'll uh, I'll copy that link. I'll watch it. Yeah, like I said, this is a, a drive-by shooting conversation. I'm happy to continue this conversation on on Twitter or LinkedIn or hopefully at some point in person. For chess.com, right? I do play I do play chess quite a bit actually. It's my it's my self shooting. It, it got me through a global pandemic, so it's fine. Cool. So yeah, we will we will start the thread up on the Slack channel. Um, folks can comment there. Um, you know, we have cloud native security con coming up and KubeCon. I don't know if you'll be there. I think a couple of folks um, from us uh, from from the tag will be there as well. So yeah, hopefully hopefully we have another opportunity to chat. If not, this was great. And thank you so much, Andrew. Thanks everyone. Awesome. Stay safe. Wear a mask. Thank you, everyone. See you next Cheers. Bye. Bye.